All right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, a fresh water system and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Brought peace? Oh, peace! Shut up! What have the Romans done for us? A lot, it seems. And it looks like Christianity is also what the Romans have done for us. The empire never ended. Yes, the idea of Christianity being an elite concoction is out there, and we've certainly dealt with it in past episodes. But in this episode, not only do we get new scholarship, but actual archaeological evidence of how the Romans invented Christianity. And, oh yeah, and Birdie Num Num, we have a bonus in the form of a co-host who elevates any conversation he participates in. And that is none other than the Bible geek himself. Robert M. Price. Some people lose their faith because heaven shows them too little. But how many people lose their faith because heaven shows them too much? So lock up your vestal virgins and hide your togas of conformity on this March, the year of our demiurge 2019. Because you have just arrived to AM Bytenostic Radio. An initiation by conversation into the dark corners of myth, magic, and meaning. A crash course in cult culture and conspiracy. A virtuous virus invoking and informing history, holiness, and heresy. Each week I, your host, Miguel Connor, commandeers your connection to bring the most accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. Fun, compelling, and deeply weird. This is the blow your mind cocktail party conversation you always wanted to listen in on. Yes, these are bruises from fighting. Yes, I'm comfortable with that. I am enlightened. Our sacred and profane quest is in line with what Franz Kafka once wrote. Don't bend. Don't water it down. Don't try to make it logical. Don't edit your own soul according to the fashion. Rather, follow your most intense obsessions mercilessly. Or as William Blake said, I must create a system or be enslaved by another man's. I will not reason and compare. My business is to create. Welcome, my son, to the machine and the means to escape it. So glad you're here at the virtual Alexandria, finding out who you are and what reality is not. Writing your own gospel and living your own myth. Becoming the best version of yourself in a creator of so much wonder and wonderful inner worlds. Do not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. There is no spoon? Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends. It is only yourself. And of course, reason and logic is important, despite what Franz said. That's how we cut through the layers of Archon false paradises and Ouroboros oil, as Vance likes to say. That's how we break down the programming of our childhood that forced us into orthodox faiths and Chinese finger trap group thought. How could you be worthy? You're all puppets tangled in strings. As mentioned, It's a delight that Robert Price joined us for this interview. A true man of reason and logic, but also playful Jungian gnosis. And our astral guests are amazing as well. They are James Valiant and Warren Fayy, authors of the outstanding new book, 
creating Christ, how Roman emperors invented Christianity. Marcus Aurelius had a dream that was Rome, Proximo. This is not it. This is not it. As mentioned before, James and Warren bring to the burning house new scholarship and mind-blowing archaeological evidence. In a work that took them 30 years to complete, yet it's truly pioneering in so many ways. You won't be disappointed on this special show that including Vance, is a five-person group discussion on ancient Christianity, paganism, and perennial social engineering. For more information on James and Warren, please visit, you got it, creatingchrist.can. What's so funny about Biggest Dickus? Don't forget, true gnosis that red pill, or sometimes red suppository, starts with accepting everything you've been told is a lie. What you experience is a simulation, and that even your own thoughts are synthetic downloads from some heavenly Tyrell corporation. And then work your way out like the dude in Plato's cave, until the son of Anamnesis awakens your inner child and inner savior. We've been lied from the beginning. Trust no one, starting with yourself. Only have faith in the beauty and usefulness you create for others and your thirst for freedom. Only run with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. Do you even exist? Probably not. But that just means you've got a large canvas to create a you that is beyond belief, beyond imagination. What's the point? You need to believe in things that aren't true. How else can they become? As Jeremy Puma wrote in his book, This Way, Listen. Gnosis tells you that the world sucks. They really are out to get you, and you don't know jack about anything. Anyone who tells you anything different is trying to get you in bed. Sure, there are benefits to Gnosis, too. But if what you're hearing about Gnosis sounds like the work of some enlightened being, or makes your BS detector start to twitch or it makes the author look good, you should probably take a step back. We'll cut the vocal cords of every empowered speaker. We'll yank the social symbols through the looking glass with the value society's currency. To confront the familiar. And what is the purpose of Gnosis? Well, the very day that the Gnostic scholar, Ian Culliano, was assassinated at the University of Chicago in May of 1991, the subject of his last lecture was on the Nag Hammadi Library. He read a quote from the prologue of the Gospel of Thomas that says, quote, Whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. To which he added, The point of Gnostic knowledge was to use it. It was meant to change the world. Is this the real world? Is this the real life? Caught in a landslide? Oh, never mind. It might be our inner world, right? I don't know. But I know you, me. We can make a difference in any world if we just take that red pill or red suppository. People that talk in metaphors ought to shampoo my crotch. James and Warren would agree with me that there is much value in the Bible artistic and ethical, and it's certainly valuable when seen as part of the history of consciousness. It's not false. On the other side, I do like what this God parody account in Twitter said recently. He said, Every word in the Bible is true. You heard me. Every word in the Bible is true. The problem is when you start putting those words in sentences and paragraphs. 
Then things go downhill real fast, and we're drowning in falsehoods and agendas. I've watched you kill each other over race and greed, wage war over dust and rubble and the words in old books. But it's all relative at the end of the day, and it's all meant to be broken apart. As it was once said, the central thesis of the Gnostic is this, what can be broken should be broken. Bringing back Blake, this poem always keeps me grounded and always annoys fundangelicals when I recite it to them. It goes, The vision of Christ that thou dost see is my vision's greatest enemy. Thine has a great hooked nose like thine. Mine has a snub nose like to mine. Thine is the friend of all mankind. Mine speaks in parables to the blind. Thine loves the same world that mine hates. Thy heaven's doors are my hell's gates. Socrates taught with Melitus, loathed as a nation's bitterest curse. And Caiaphas was in his own mind a benefactor to mankind. Both read the Bible day and night, but thou readest black where I read white. And on the third day, God created the Remington Bull Action Rifle so that man could fight the dinosaurs and the homosexuals. Amen. But enough of my drivel. Led us to the interview with James Valiant and Warren Faye on their new book, Creating Christ. And for both members and non-members, we end with the song Guilty Machine, a very Gnostic tune by the very talented and Dionysian Donovan Sims. Most of all, he's a good man. Did I mention the empire never ended? It really didn't. Nipples for Men This is the A.M. Byte interview, and with us, we are definitely glad to have James Valiant and Warren Fahi to discuss their new and very exciting book, Creating Christ, How Roman Emperors Invented Christianity. How are you doing today, James and Warren? Oh, real good. Just fine. Thanks. Uh, truly a pleasure having you on. Uh, as I was telling you, this is a book I, I couldn't put it down. It was well written. My jaw was dropping because you brought so much that other books of this, uh, you might say, genre of the the Romans creating uh, Christianity. I sort of gave away the plot right now. But uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about it. And in this very special show, it's also great to be joined by the Bible geek himself, Robert M. Price. How are you doing today, Bob? Alms for next leper. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, doing fine. Uh, it's, uh, doing great. Yeah. Yes, indeed. We were discussing uh, Monty Python and the famous uh, What Have the Romans Ever Done for Us skit. And uh, now we're finding out with this great new book, they really have done a lot for us, it seems. Uh, they gave us, uh, well, they've given us a religion and so much more, as we'll be discussing. And certainly last but not least, we've got the Abraxas Chicken Wing Man and the Moondog himself, Vance Sachi. How are you doing today, Vance? Oh, I'm great. I'm looking forward to hearing how Biggest Dickus created Christ. <laughs> oh, yeah. Naughtiest yeah, Maximus. That's the wife, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was just watching that skit the other day, of course, and uh, my favorite is you're all individuals. Yes, we're all individuals, <laughs> explains culture today. I'm not him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but wonderful. So, uh, of course, having Bob here, I would love Bob to be sort of a, a co-host. Uh, you guys were all on the great Myth Vision podcast with uh, my friends, and he did a great job. But, of course, but I want Bob to uh, sit down because Bob has also written a review of your work. So he, I'm sure he has plenty to say. I have plenty to say because I'm very excited about this book. 
But why don't we start uh, with you guys, uh, James and Warren. Tell us a, a little bit about yourselves. Uh, well, uh, I'm James, and I'm a native of Los Angeles. I was a deputy district attorney in San Diego County for about 17 years, where I prosecuted murder and rape and child molest cases. Uh, I have a, J- a JD from the University of San Diego and a degree in philosophy from uh, New York University. Um, but for the last 35 years, my real passion has been the investigation of the origins of Christianity and reading men like Dr. Price's work and uh, original source material, as well as archaeolo- archaeological evidence, um, all in a quest to, to sort of understand the New Testament. Yeah, uh, I am uh, his friend since the fifth grade, sixth yeah, grade. Yeah, fifth grade, I think. Yeah, yeah uh, known each other our whole lives, and uh, I've been a writer, a long-suffering a uh, starving writer until I finally got my first <laughs> book published with Random House, and it was published in 18 languages, and it's a thriller. Um, so I brought those skills to the table out over the last 35 years of working with James on this project, um, and we uh, we created Creating Christ. It's really the, the, just the summary of a collective of about 70 years worth of uh, investigations on our own. Uh, unlike uh, Dr. Price, we really don't have an academic background in this uh, at all. But we rolled up our sleeves decades ago and we decided there was no uh, easy way to, to get there. And so we started uh, with our fine archaeological pick tools and uh, came up with what we what you've been reading. Yes, indeed. I mean, like you said, this is something that took 30 years. It's amazing. Uh, that's quite a, a labor of love. So how did it start? I mean, it, did it start really with uh, we need to figure out Christianity or how did you go down this rabbit hole? Well, I can I can answer that. This is Warren. Um, I was uh, awoken in uh, at an ungodly hour. Um, <laughs> I, I lived in a, a a room that was right next to the street. It was kind of like Diogenes's wine barrel, and um, any and friends of mine would would just crawl through the window at any moment, at any time of the day. I was used to it, um, and so one of the one of these nights, uh, James appeared, and um, he ha- was just too excited to uh to leave it till the next day and he told me about what he had been looking at and that after hours and hours of discussing some of the new things that he had just discovered which had to do with uh the jo- Josephus and the description of the fall of Jerusalem and the comparison to Jesus's prophecy um and that that one connection was the lightning bolt that started it all and um, from that point forward, we at, at the end of that discussion, we had decided that it was probably a Flavian dynastic cult, and we immediately started looking out for coins that might reflect their Roman agenda and the, that would overlap with a Christian agenda. We didn't find that coin until, the, as you, if you read the book, you know, until the very end right. of those thirty years of work. I have to say, I was initially myself somewhat skeptical. Uh, as Mr. Fay kept insisting that we would find hard uh, visual archaeological evidence uh, for this. And I thought to myself, well, the New Testament wasn't aimed at the empire generally. It was aimed at a very specific target audience, uh, rebellious, militant, messianic Hebrews of the first and second centuries. And because it was so targeted and so specific, I wouldn't think that there would have been Say on the coinage or on general or in general Roman propaganda, much by way of evidence. But boy, was I wrong. Over the last three decades, we've uh, found copious amounts of evidence connecting uh, first first century Roman propaganda directly to the New Testament. Probably we should get to the the main event, the thing again that blew me away because. Uh while you guys were writing this book, many years ago, I read obviously uh, Joe Atwell Caesar's Messiah, and I was I enjoyed it a lot. And of course, I've read Bob's critiques of it, Acharya's, and Joe Atwell in the Jesus Mystery Groups would argue with a lot of guys there. And it was always it was a fascinating thesis. I also read the the book by the Italian fellow who also wrote something like that. Do you remember the name of this guy, Bob? I forget his name. Uh, Luigi Cascioli. There you go. No, yes. Francesco Corotta. Yes, I read that book well, and I'm it was sorry. fascinating. I'm sorry. Which one we talking about? Oh, that's right. Are you thinking of talking about? Yeah, it Jesus was Luigi. Was Caesar? 
Yeah, and then he, or, and he also uh, sued uh, the Vatican or something like well, that? Uh, Cascioli was the guy that uh, said that um, Jesus, there was no historical Jesus exactly, but the origin uh, of the notion was, uh, geez, uh, something like, not Judas of Galilee, but somebody like that or connected with him. And he did sue the Catholic Church saying that this is a fraud and they know it, which I find a little hard to believe. But yeah, he, he did have a similar sort of a theory. As an attorney, Dr. Price, I can, tell, I can say your uh, instinct is right there. That's probably a pretty weak lawsuit. <laughs> mm, yeah, it uh, got tossed out immediately, but I, th I believe he died shortly thereafter, so we wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't have seen any victory had he won it, sadly. Well, that's a coincidence. But, of course, there's the Italian scholar who argues that Julius Caesar, no less. Yes, was right. The, oh, really? The, the, yeah, exactly, the prototype for Jesus in the Gospels, and that's Francesco Carota. Mm-hmm. Yes, again, there's almost a, you could put this under the mythicist or the many mythicist theory. You could put the Caesar's Messiah or Roman invention under that, and there's different angles. But again, your angle, which is so fascinating, besides all the rest of your great scholarship, is the physical evidence. And that blew me away because I realized that some of these symbols I've used when I was a Catholic. And I was like, oh, wow. So maybe tell the audience about this evidence. Well, uh, the, uh, we had been searching high and low, as I said, for, for this evidence. I was fairly convinced that it, it did exist someplace, that it would have to, just because the Romans were so uh, propagandistic about it, everything they approached. Um, and they would, they would certainly have, uh, in some way, affiliated themselves publicly with the Christian movement. Um, so when I, I was finally, it was very, very fascinating. My mother had visited Rome 25 years ago. And she had gotten a plaque. The, one of the few souvenirs she brought back was a plaque from the catacombs of St. Domitilla of the anchor uh, uh, flanked by two fish. And, of course, this is considered to be the, the oldest archaeological site um, with evidence of Christianity. Um, and so I had actually, she gave this to me. I had it on my wall and uh, for the last 25 years. And so here I'm looking for some sort of really esoteric pattern <laughs> that might be in a Roman coin. I, I keep coming across these coins of Titus with the anchor and the dolphin on them, and it's just not clicking at all. Finally, I just looked up at the wall, and I saw this plaque. I said, wait a minute. There it is. It's right in front of us. And so I called James up, and I said, you know, here's this coin. And he said, oh, well, surely other Roman emperors must have used that coin. I said, no, it's, it started with Titus. It ended with the mission. Uh, later, we found out there was an Alexandrian coin issued by Hadrian, which actually completed the whole uh, evolutionary um, record in coinage um, of, of from from Flavian imperial provenance to fully Christian by the time Hadrian had used it during the Second Jewish War. So at, at that when he when when I explained it to him, and he started immediately googling and trying to find if there was any other per, emperor who had used this symbol. And we just said, that's it. We got it. But it, you know. it, it is an astonish, astonishing thing. Back in 1983, when I was first pounding on his window with the insight from the texts, <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> we had never heard of, uh, uh, Joseph Atwell, whose work we, we do in many ways respect and we've learned a great deal from, uh, but we'd never heard of Francesco Corona. Uh, we, uh, well, this was in 1983, in 83, I believe. Yeah. And it, 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 more recently, and, and just within the last decade and a half, I was working on a monograph on Roman propaganda in coins, ironically. And so when he found this symbol that was on, you know, on one side, you've got the emperor Titus on the other side, you've got the very same symbol that was used for Jesus Christ for the first three centuries, uh, on the very other side of the same coin. Uh, it's then suddenly it all clicked into place. Oh, I know. And, uh, Go ahead, Bob. What technique? What technique did you use to fabricate this coin? Oh, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> uh, all that money. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, was there? Uh, I remember from the book that you were able to point to loads of examples of how you had either the uh, trident and the the porpoises or fish or whatever, or uh, the anchor, 
and it, it seems to me, I may not be remembering it uh, clearly enough, but it seems like you had a bunch of instances where the Flavian dynasty used this as a kind of a trademark, and also uh, that Christians used it, and, and you made the effective argument, how could this be if, uh, if these uh, same Flavians are persecuting the heck out of the Christians? I mean, what kind of Stockholm syndrome uh, <laughs> nonsense would nice. this have been? Now, thank you, sir. May I have another? Uh, and and uh, so did this particular coin really was, uh, this is the wrong image, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back. Was this somehow decisive since you had a number of other um, bits of evidence pointing in the same direction? No, I, I, I don't. I think we were convinced by then it was just a really a cherry on, on, to, on top. Actually, we kind of mm-hmm. thought it was as the star on top of the Christmas tree. <laughs> um, <laughs> so from there, we decided it was a good, a strong entry point to tell the story in reverse of how we how we got to that coin. And mm-hmm. so, yeah. you know, I think that it was, frankly, uh, moments like uh, understanding the the parabolic nature of the passion narrative. I think when we when we reduced the for me at least when it was I realized that the entire passion narrative which is clearly fiction uh forms a pro roman parable and forms uh, almost anti uh jewish propaganda aimed at the militant nationalist rebels of the first and second centuries that's when it it really hit and I think it's the pilot story, the story of the Jewish crowd artificially demanding Jesus's crucifixion three times. In Matthew's version, the crowd, I guess in unison, says his blood is on us and on our children, which we really don't need. Uh, any any of the four Gospels uh, speak loud and clear the same theme. And once you once we accept the fact that the passion narrative is fiction, an artificial story. And then we ask ourselves, why do all four Gospels share the same basic skeleton of uh, this parable? And there's really only one answer. It is to exonerate the Romans and to blame collectively uh, the Hebrew people uh, for the execution of their own Messiah as a means of justifying the conquest soon to come, (laughs) sort of in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. by... Right, very much like Jeremiah, who's depicted as uh, saying, "You might as well give up and go home. You're not going to defeat the Babylonians because <laughs> right. God sent them, because <laughs> you guys uh, uh, welched on the, the Deuteronomic covenant. What do you expect?" And they say, "Oh, you're a traitor. Let's throw this guy down the well." And uh, and that itself is is quite likely another instance of the same thing. Right. Uh, if, Babylonian Jews, of whom there were very many, and they got along well during the exile, uh, they they would have been motivated to uh, to say, well, you see, we're we're the good guys. You see, who prospers and who doesn't? Uh, we, God sent us here, uh, and by the the gracious hand of the Babylonians, it's it's a strange thing, but it makes a lot of sense in both cases. Uh, you, what what's the alternative? Saying, well, I, I guess we were wrong about Jehovah and the whole thing. Uh, I guess uh, their God beat up ours. You're not, I mean, people have concluded things like that, but uh, you probably wouldn't want to, and so you've got to make the best of a bad situation and say, okay, it's it's ruined, but uh, I guess we deserved it. That's better than thinking God abandoned this. Well, it, it's sort of a problem inherent in monotheism, and yep. uh, Hebrewism clearly emerged, uh, you know, monotheism emerged in that context from polytheistic uh, culture, but at some point they became very, very, not only monotheists, but very, very fierce monotheists. And if that's the case, if you're being punished by the one almighty creator God uh, uh, or something bad is happening to you, it must be interpreted as a punishment. In other Mm -hmm. words, I can't be rewarding those idol-worshipping polytheists. We're God's chosen people. And if we're right about him being the one almighty creator God, then he must be, we must have let down uh, God on the covenant. And so it's a punishment of us as opposed to mm-hmm. a reward for anyone else. Um, mm-hmm. It's sort of built into the situation. How did we fail God? And that's a big clue that, that he's also saying it, it will be on our children. Uh, why, we, why include that detail unless you are trying to explain what's going to happen a generation later? Specifically, right. too. 
that group of children. Mm -hmm. And in some and that, ways, the text is just is not doesn't really make much sense, except it, when seen in the first century context of war, religiously motivated war. Um, uh, there are many, many, many examples, but the text was enough to convince us. But we knew we wanted to have a, a interdisciplinary, um, uh, integrated uh, approach to it using the widest possible uh, range of evidence and uh, the best methods we could across the board. One of the things. Well, yeah, that's very effective because the whole uh, uh, coinage thing. And I mean, that really sets the stage in a way I'd never heard of before. Well, what was also fascinating is along the way, we would we would read, for instance, an account uh, of the miracles that were performed by Vespasian, and mm -hmm. we'd say, "Wait a minute, what were the miracles that Jesus performed again?" <laughs> and when we uh, paid dirt every single time, every single time, every single time. You know, Dr. Price is one of the great pioneers of showing the world uh, all the various pagan precedents. I mean, <laughs> all you have to do is look at uh, Egypt, Greece, and all the various ancient cultures of the Near East, and y all you have to do is sort of throw a dart randomly, and you can find a pagan deity that resembles Jesus in some way. And Dr. Price is, of course, one of the great experts who's taught us all that so, so very, very. And so we already had in our mind, there's pagan precedents for this. What we were surprised to find is that those pagan precedents also include Roman emperors. Best and I think we should back up a bit because I have a feeling maybe there's some people in the audience who might not get the exact thesis, although all of us here know it. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but basically the thesis of James and Warren is once upon a time, a group of rebels, it wasn't Star Wars, it was the Jewish people, uh, decided to rise up against the mighty empire, the Roman Empire, and it created a very vicious war. Uh, what, uh, yeah, a vicious war, very destructive war. And it was uh, two Roman generals, Vespasian and his son Titus, who were able to break the back of the Jewish people after a long war. Vespasian went back to Rome, became the emperor, and because of this huge bloodshed, because of a group of people that were very exclusive about their gods, unlike the Roman Empire, who was very inclusive about their gods, they decided the best thing to do was to market a new religious, a Jewish mystery religion school that would appease the Jews, but also make what, in a sort of subconscious way, make the Romans look good. I mean, where am I? Am I right, or where am I off, guys? Well, I think that that the Romans sincerely were trying to integrate the best of their own social, moral, and metaphysical thinking into uh, the messianic religion that was pr uh, proving to be so problematic for them. Uh, there, We have to remember that at this time, there was really no separation in people's minds between religion re or, or, or the craft of religion and statecraft. They, they were so carefully overlapping uh, and almost engineered to overlap that it makes it seem to us perhaps like a cynical thing that's going on. But I don't think it was all cynical. I think that in a... Uh, for a great many Jews, for example, uh, when God uh, speaks through victory, uh, we have to pay attention. If, in fact, the Romans did defeat us, we must have gotten something wrong. And perhaps we should uh, reach out and try and assimilate some ideas that maybe we missed out on. So from both sides, I think there's a, a, a sort of a pious fraud, perhaps, as it's a, a new form of pious fraud, if you will. That's going on where they're actually attempting to integrate and assimilate two different cultures uh, in a in a sincere way in, to a large extent. To, to that, it, it, the problem goes away if we see the Gospels as allegories, as pa parables, uh, because the people for whom uh, it was originally written would have had no problem seeing the, par the parallels, say, to the Flavians. In, to a first century ear, they would have heard those miracles. And they would have said, hey, isn't that, weren't those the generals that conquered us? And they're of humble origin and stars herald their death and birth and so forth and so on. Um, in fact, uh, as one historian put it, they were ostentatiously modest. They really sold their humble origins big. 
and uh, they sold their their altruistic uh, uh, benevolence as well. God is helping others, uh, says uh, Flavian propaganda. God is love, if you will. And seeing these ideological parallels doesn't make me uh, doubt the sincerity of uh, the basic idea. Uh, it just makes me think these are very, very sophisticated uh, uh, thinkers. And what about you, Bob? What do you think about this thesis? Uh, I've read your work on, uh, you know, arguing with Joe, not arguing, but you know what I mean, how your critiques of uh, Caesar's Messiah. What uh, what do you think of creating Christ? Uh, well, he does, like a, a lot of the problem I had with Joe's work, brilliant though it is in many ways, and I want to give him credit. Uh, uh, he, I find a number of uh, things he said, ancillary contentions as uh unpersuasive and by that i don't mean uh, they're out of the question they're absurd it's just that some of the parallels he pointed out with uh josephus and the gospels struck me as being possible but uh how could you really know uh like fc bauer said uh anything's possible but the historian wants to know what is probable and i figured a lot of this is merely speculative some of it i thought uh was uh just impossible like the the motives of the people that wrote the gospels according to to joe that uh, they were trying to mock jews or and this seems inconsistent create a kind of an intelligence test to see if people could figure out the real meaning of it i thought no no, no this is this doesn't sound right plus you if that was it why would you have all of this moral uh, philosophy uh, in in the the text it just wouldn't read that way but of course you don't really need any of that uh to uh make this this broader uh point and uh, some of the bizarre harmonizations he did like trying to uh take the the um of uh, resurrection accounts is all compatible. I've never seen a fundamentalist Christian do the the weird sleight of hand he did. I don't know why. I don't know what the point was. And uh, but the uh, but this the and the the main premise just struck me as arbitrary. But what about the Flavians creating Christianity? But this is the, for me, the, there are two big contributions in creating Christ that uh, made it plausible. Uh, one of them was knowing that there was actually a propagated belief that uh, you find among uh, Jews and Roman historians, uh, only two of each, but the evidence is inevitably going to be fragmentary, but uh, Johannan ben Zakai uh, and Josephus both said that Vespasian, and, and then it kind of implies Titus as well, uh, was the Messiah. Now, you could say these guys are just cowards, and they're trying to say, uh, like uh, Winston Zettimore does in Ghostbusters, uh, lady, I'll believe anything you say as long as there's a steady paycheck in it. But, uh, but we don't know that. I mean, they say, they give a, a, a scriptural proof text and so on. And then uh, the fact that Suetonius and Tacitus both say Vespasian, Vespasian was the Jewish king prophesied in their scripture, why would they say that unless that was some kind of an official propaganda line? And I don't mean propaganda in a cynical sense. I mean, if that was an official view. Uh, and, and so that's number one. It, it isn't just pulled out of, out of a hat, the notion that uh, you could identify the Jewish Messiah with uh, the, the two Flavian uh, biggies. But then uh, that coupled with the... Uh, statute of limitations in the Olivet Discourse, you know, the Synoptic Apocalypse, Mark 13, and the parallels, when uh, it says that uh, you're going to see the, um, the the fall of Jerusalem and the temple within the contemporary generation. Now, if, if you say Jesus really did say that, 
uh, well, okay, he was wrong, but how would that get into the Gospels? Who would have remembered a false prophecy, a failed prediction? Uh, and uh, if you say, well, as with, with the rest of it, it was fabricated by Christians, well, that's even worse. Well, why would they have uh, <laughs> fabricated and preserved uh, a failed prophecy from Jesus? They must have thought it was fulfilled in some way. And then when you see that in the... Uh, in Mark 13, Jesus never actually is depicted as saying he will return. It says that people will falsely come in his name. Is part of that falsehood that he was supposed to return? Uh, it says the son of Ma the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. Even if we didn't have this interesting Josephus. Uh, parallel with the the battle in the sky, though, though that's powerful. E even if we didn't have that, it's obvious whoever wrote this figure that whatever happened in 70 A.D. was what he was predicting. Well, what was that? It was Titus and and the destruction of the of the temple. So I, I had never thought of any of that stuff, and, and this made it all click. So I find it quite uh, plausible. And if I can just throw in one other thing. If you plug in um, Brandon's Jesus and the Zealots hypothesis, this fits beautifully. And and because uh, I've always said that if there was a historical Jesus, I think Brandon had him right, and Rymaris before him that Jesus would was a failed messianic rebel. Uh, that the cleansing of the temple was a raid on the temple, and that that's being downplayed in the gospel. Well. Um, the uh, Brandon says, okay, it had a revolutionary beginning, and that attracted the hostility, the hostile uh, attention of Rome. So Mark rewrote the story to say, hey, look, you don't have to worry about us. Uh, we're, we're not interested in uh, rebelling against Rome. Oh, no, no, just the reverse. Uh, don't get the wrong idea even though loose ends remain that like the cleansing of the temple that it was revolutionary but it's been rewritten to domesticate christianity and make it roman friendly well all you need to do to to combine this with the creating christ scenario is to say the guy that did this was a was a uh, Flavian Christian or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, who would have been that interested in remodeling, retooling, rewriting Christianity to, to glorify the the Romans and to say, well, they have more faith than the Jews, etc. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. It didn't come from within Christianity, but from without, and that uh, domesticated version caught on. Yeah, James and Warren, yeah, you're our guests, but do you have a, a question for Bob or Rebecca? Well, I think I'll, I'll just make the point that it's what's uh, rather hard to believe when you look at the actual historical context is how in the world, when Rome is, is locked in this, this war with the Jews, during that time, are they allowing Christianity to just flourish? and take off across the empire. <laughs> yes. mm. Presumably we have all of this church organizing activity between the two great Jewish wars. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. all, and every, everybody's just having fun. <laughs> and stuff were written, apparently. Um, you know, let's organize churches in every district in the island of Crete, mind you. We're going to have <laughs> bishops appointed, right? Mm. You, you know, you make you, – Dr. Price, uh, I'm I'm deeply, deeply impressed by your understanding of – what we're trying to do we're trying we tried so hard to provide while we don't take a position on whether there was a historical jesus because i think we're agnostics very much like dr Price is <laughs> on the subject uh, we're trying to, to however do two things one how on earth did pagan man god elements get integrated into the most culturally resistant uh uh, in fact, separatist, nationalist, militant uh, group of uh, the group that the empire was facing. That's a sort of a paradox right there. And if there was a historical Jesus, he I think he would have had to have been pretty much the opposite of what we read, read in the Gospels. He was almost certainly Torah Orthodox. Most scholars, I think the best arguments are that the, all the original apostles were Torah Orthodox. Paul's argument in Galatians would make no sense but for that. And if that's the case... 
then how on earth did, uh, uh, if there was a historical Jesus, and we're not certain of that, did he get turned upside down, inside out, and to the very opposite? And so what we're doing is, uh, just to follow up on what Dr. Price was saying, we're providing a causal explanation, if you will, implicitly, for both of those things to happen. I mean, why on earth would this paradoxical uh, collision have occurred at precisely this moment uh, in history when there is a religiously motivated messianic war going on? To us, the, there must be a causal relationship between the two. It seems, uh, it seems that the, the New Testament is obsessed with uh, uh, assimilation in, a, in the very period of religion. Bingo. And, you know, just to follow up on another point Dr. Price made, so... Oh, to, by the way, please just call me Bob. Okay, Bob. Uh, 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 I, uh, it's, it's, sometimes when I have that much respect for someone, it's hard to, uh, to get that uh, built in, but I'll try, Bob. Um, uh, uh, another point you made that was just absolutely uh, brilliant when we read Josephus, it's he's clearly not just making a perfunctory nod when he says Vespasian was the Messiah, the true Messiah. He tells us his own personal story, and through it he says God has gone over to the Roman side. He has he describes his own prophetic uh, uh, dreams and visions. He describes his ability to interpret those, and through those, Josephus, the historian is credulously telling us that the Jewish God is now on Rome's side. This can, whether the author uh, actually believed it or not, is really beside the point. There is clearly a Roman effort to um, modify Judaism, uh, to pacify it. And if Josephus doesn't represent that, I don't know what does. And the New Testament would just simply be another example of the same that's, sort that's of... Right. Uh, one uh, one uh, case of this kind of thing I hadn't even thought of until now. Uh, look at the book of Fourth Maccabees. They they glorify the rebels against the Seleucid tyranny, uh, and uh, with with the, uh, the the suffering of the martyrs and all of that. But what is the ultimate point of Fourth Maccabees? It's a treatise in Jewish Stoicism. I mean, very clearly Hellenistic philosophy about the supremacy of reason. Well, these guys were Hellenistically assimilated Jews, but certainly did not find it uh, incompatible with venerating great martyrs against the uh, the Hellenistic powers. And uh, so there's, all you have to realize is that these Jewish wars against Rome were revitalization movements trying to preserve a threatened ancestral culture against enemies within and without. Uh, the, the relation being that the enemies within are the assimilators that uh, don't really mind being uh, absorbed by the, the imperial power. Uh, whether it was the Seleucids or the Romans, hey, they, they sound pretty good. In fact, maybe their god is the same as ours. Uh, I mean, we have Jewish and other documents and say that Jehovah Dionysus, what's the difference? Uh, and so if, they, if there would have been two sides to this discussion, there would have been assimilating Hellenistically inclined Jews, and, and Acts even tells us there was a Hellenistic synagogue of the freedmen in, in Jerusalem itself. So the, the, you would have had the James the Just faction who, who doubled down on Torah orthodoxy because they're resisting the, the Hellenite faction. So you don't even really have to say that uh, the Romans, uh, the Flavians somehow designed this and said, hey, look, here's your new religion. Uh, it, they would have had plenty of, if you want to use the word, collaborators, but people that embraced that. And already the second Isaiah says that Cyrus the Persian, uh, who was actually a worshiper of other gods, that he is my Messiah. I mean, it's, it's not far-fetched at all. When we add to the fact that a Hellenizing uh, allegorical Jewish philosopher such as Philo Judaeus of the mid-first century, his nephews were actually personal associates of the Flavians. Bingo, the Flavians yeah, themselves right. Were, were themselves had personal connections with uh, Hellenized Jews of Alexandria and elsewhere, and that could be why they were given the assignment to uh, put down the Jewish rebellion in the first place. In Christianity... Yeah. Christianity would have been very convenient for just those sorts of Jews. Precisely. Mm -hmm. His son Titus, the, the emperor who succeeded him, 
we're told at least, I don't know how reliable the report is, that he uh, came close to marrying Berenice, the Jewish princess. Now imagine mm. a person like her. Now she, of course, is, is positively figured, uh, positively figures in Acts of the Apostles along with her brother, uh, which is also interesting. But imagine how convenient Christianity would have been to them. Mm-hmm. Social engineering. Philo is already arguing against Hellenized Jews who say the uh, the Jewish scriptures are allegorically true. And, of course, that whole method of uh, interpretation was borrowed right from the Stoics. They said, now that we understand the allegorical significance of all the laws, there's no point in continuing to obey them. And Philo said, now, wait just a minute. Let's not go quite that far. But there you can see the intra-Christian debate you have in the New Testament. Do you have to actually keep the laws if the whole point of it is... uh, do unto others they should have them do unto you and so on that's where that's where the writings of paul in the new testament make a sharp elbow we see in philo a resistance to giving up at least on the substance of the mosaic law that resistance is completely broken down in the in the new testament in the letters of paul paul is specifically right. making an extended argument for why we are now, quote, free in Christ, <laughs> and we don't need to uh, follow uh, several of the particulars of Mosaic law anymore. In fact, the most culturally distinctive ones <laughs> in the Roman world, circumcision, kosher diet, eating with Gentiles, that's all gone, says Paul. We don't need to worry about that. Or as pseudo-Paul, if it's not Paul in Ephesians, says the wall of separation has now been broken down between Gentile and Jew. And so we we looked back at it and we said, wasn't cultural assimilation really then the whole point? Yes, I'm glad you put it that way. Yeah, uh, that you can see. I mean, even today, uh, when uh, Jews, Orthodox Jews, look like the bigots when they oppose interfaith marriage and all that, I don't view it that way. They have every right to preserve their own community, which they're not going to do if you have free assimilation through intermarriage. I, I can see that. So you can see the same issue in the New Testament. And nobody's the bad guys. It's just uh, one of these recurrent historical tensions. That is precisely correct. Right. We wanted to to view this in that in those terms exactly. No one was the bad guy here. I mean, mm. obviously it's two thousand years ago, and neither side are were Boy Scouts. <laughs> the Romans were absolutely brutal. It I was mean, a Game of Thrones. Everybody had their own agenda. Yes, sir. The Romans mm. put up a forest of crosses and tortured thousands and thousands. It was a brutal, brutal war. Two brutal wars, in fact. But uh, and and the uh, Jewish messianics were were no Boy Scouts either. Um, mm-hmm. They compelled the, their allies, for example, to become certain. Now, can you imagine adult males being forced to undergo circumcision in order simply to become allied to the Jewish rebellion? Mm-hmm. But we're told that's exactly what happened. You just brought up Paul. So to be clear for the audience. Christianity did exist before the Flavians came around. We did have Paul. I think some have said that the Flavians invented everything whole cloth, but there was Christianity before they came around. No, we accept uh, I, I, uh, we accept the standard dating of at least the genuine Pauline epistles, or at least it's consistent with our, our thinking. Um, many scholars have questioned, of course, the uh, exact dating and timing of the Pauline epistles. But we try to hew to the standard um uh, accepted consensus view as much we agree with uh, dr price consensus is no argument but on the other hand <laughs> unless we have a uh, good argument uh, we follow the standard view um and i know dr price has some good arguments about the dating of the pauline epistles even galatians and romans but uh we accept the standard view so we believe it started under nero at the very least maybe even earlier in fact what had started under nero might have actually precipitated the war. What did Christianity look like? Are we talking about Paul's Christianity that was breaking away already from Judaism or Hellenizing Judaism? Is that more or less the Christianity that was there? If we assume that the so-called authentic Pauline epistles were written before the the, uh, Jewish war, then clearly what we're looking at is the actual development, the evolution of Christian ideas themselves in the letters of Paul. There's really, uh, there could be a little doubt in my mind. He's describing having visions. He's describing uh, how, in fact, the, 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 I, I, one of the great uh, 
thinkers uh, who influenced my own thinking on this, and I, 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 I know Dr. Price has been influenced by him as well, the great late G.A. Wells, one of the oh, great yeah. of the 20th century. And when he lays out the evolution, we basically accept his model for the evolution of the documents of the New Testament from Paul through the Gospels, with some recent modifications, but largely we accept that model. And uh, I think the, you bring up that Paul might have been an agent of Rome. Is that a theory? What do you think of this, Bob? Have you heard this idea before? I mean, I know we talk about Paul as Simon Magus, but there's also the idea that Paul was already in the pocket of the Romans. And good argument. Well, in the book. Um, it's uh, interesting that you can combine those two without trying to just uh, without needing an ad hoc hypothesis, I'm uh, about 50 pages into this book, Operation Messiah, where the, they make this very interesting argument that Paul was a, an undercover agent for Rome. Um, the, pro the big problem I have with that book is it takes, well, as it, as it uh, rightly accuses other critical scholars of doing, it still takes acts as fundamentally historically accurate right. and and i uh don't uh think you can do that so there's uh i i have a I, I, that I, undermined I, I, may i give you a video high five uh dr price uh, Rob, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, mm. they do that is exactly my own criticism of it it accepts too much uh the historical reliability of acts brilliantly insightful book we rely upon yeah. it deal but it 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 uh, acts is just thoroughly unhistorical it is mm. uh, i'd i'd use stronger language even than that but uh, <laughs> i hate to interrupt uh, bob but i i can't yeah. high five him on that thought right there well, though you could, if you, uh, like, I, I'm persuaded by the Dutch radical critics, uh, so-called, uh, especially W.C. Van Manen. Uh, I put together a, a collection of his articles in English. He's written hundreds and hundreds of pages in Dutch and German that have never been translated, but uh, several, especially for the Encyclopedia Biblica were written in English and uh, Ed Sawoman and I gathered those and published them as a book called A Wave of Hypercriticism as as his enemies called it uh, and uh, I find Van Manen's arguments that there are no authentic Pauline epistles to be very, very convincing. I mean, it's not decisive who can know, but very powerful, especially since we have a bunch of so-called Petrine uh, documents that no critical scholar thinks Peter wrote. It was just he, his name was so big, they attributed gospels, revelations, sermons, letters to him, all of them spurious. And, and uh, mainstream scholars say that six out of the seven uh, accepted uh, – uh, wait a minute, sorry. Oh, um, no, that, that uh, seven out of the 13 with Paul's name on them aren't written by him anyway, and some drop one of the, the seven. Uh, Bauer thought there were only four authentic ones, and uh, these other guys, the Dutch radicals, said we can use the same sort of analysis to show that uh, none of them w would go back to that period. And I, I'm also persuaded by Hermann Dettering, uh, who, who just tragically died. Yeah, in rest in peace. Is the greatest That's New so Testament awesome. scholar of our time. Yeah. Uh, he made a powerful argument on behalf of Dutch radicalism, which he kind of revived, uh, and uh, showed that uh, Bauer, you could take Bauer a step farther and say that not only are Simon Magus and Paul two different accounts of the same person in acts for different propaganda reasons, but that the historical Paul was actually Simon Magus, who is mentioned by Josephus as sort of the Rasputin figure in that circle of people with Bernice and Festus and, and all those guys. And uh, now, if that's the case, and this is Paul, and, and the, these people were sort of on the in connection with the Flavians, there might not really be a choice to make on that uh, yes. the dating of Paul. He might not have been earlier than the Flavians. Right. Right. It's the, you know, I, I, and may I just say, by the way, since our recent great loss with him, you, uh, sir, Bob, are probably the outstanding representative of uh, Dutch radical critical thinking alive today in the world. 
if I may just I, I'm afraid I am by default. Daryl Dowdy, a professor of mine, uh, he got into this the same time I did, and we published a translation of one of Dettering's books, The Falsified Paul, later read done as the fabricated Paul. And uh, it was just really about the three of us at that time. And now I'm afraid I'm the only one left. So uh, I, I'm uh, just, say so. just the, uh, the residue of the modern Dutch radicals, sadly. What, what I think the reason why I still remain uh, open to the idea of an early dating for at least some of the Pauline epistles is their sheer ignorance of gospel material. I mean, oh, well, I wrote an essay on that uh, in my book, um, uh, The Amazing Colossal Apostle, The Search for the Historical Paul, uh, called something like, Does Mythicism Demand uh, an Early Date for the Pauline Epistles? And though everybody, including Wells, seems to regard an early dating as a cornerstone, I try to show that's not necessary at all. It's uh, just like what Walter Schmidt says about Q versus uh, Mark, that you right. just have different types of Christianity surviving side by okay. side. And if I may also by add, internal clues, you have to hypothesize which is the earlier one. And if I may also add, your analysis of, of Q and its Hellenized Stoic roots uh, is just brilliant, Dr. Price. You know, oh, it, yeah, that's all Burton Mack. Yeah, I, I think he's right about it, though there's no, I don't think he's, he's made a, a, a one big mistake in my humble opinion. I mean, who am I to, to say this on uh, Mack? <laughs> but uh, he, and, and I think he misled George Wells, too, because he said, you see, when you, uh, it, when you isolate the so-called Q2 and 3 uh, material, the, the okay. l later strata that, that many scholars agree on, uh, the, the, what is left does not have explicit Christianity, and it falls naturally into seven topical sections, which is in turn a pretty good argument that there was this Q1 uh, and uh, that circulated originally as a, a separate document, and it's hardly Christian. Well, um, cynic the, than anything. The problem, really, right? What's that? I'm sorry. More cynic than anything, maybe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and uh, and Mac makes the mistake of saying, "Well, this is here. You have a uh, a, a distinctive voice and, and sort of ironic uh, approach, kind of like Diogenes." Well, the problem is, so that's got to be somebody, and obviously some individual, and that's got to be Jesus, uh, whom Bob Funk once said was the first Jewish stand-up comic, uh, and there, there's a point to that. Uh, well, the problem is, no, your whole argument draws effective parallels between the Q1 material and material by a variety of cynic sources. Okay. All you've shown is that there's a distinctive cynic flavor to this, not That's... that there's an individual behind it. And that, to me, destroys the argument that, uh, that made uh, Wells finally abandon straight mythicism. Right. And, and, but all of this is not original with me, except that one I didn't argument. I need to take that. us down, down into that level of detail, but I, I just want to say I very, very much appreciate all your work on this. It's so important, Dr. Price. Um, the, the, on the question of Paul and Paul's ignorance, I think I'm in, you, you've, you've convinced me that it's not necessary, but I think I'm still open to the idea that it's possible that oh, yeah, sure. of the epistles sure. were that old. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just a question of different paradigms, and you look at this possible framework and, and say, what would, if true, what would this reveal about the meaning of this stuff? Uh, does it uh, make more sense of it? And that's going to be subjective. But uh, the, the Dutch radical paradigm seems to me to make more sense of a lot of strange things. But the other one does, too. In fact, in The Amazing Colossal Apostle and the Pre-Nicene New Testament, I tackle the, all of the epistles a la the Dutch radicals and try to explain why this isn't authentic and what did produce it, etc. But in um, 
the uh, third uh, volume of Holy Fable, when I deal with the Pauline epistles, I say, well, my uh, Dutch radical view is on display elsewhere. Let's now see what we can, uh, how well this holds up under the standard critical view of the seven authentic ones. And uh, a lot of that makes sense, too. So I, I just feel like, you know, I want to balance the two off and see uh, how productive each paradigm is. There's certainly no way to know. Right. No, no, sir, I, I have to say that but for uh, the work of men like you, we could never have come up with creating Christ. Your balanced yeah. approach serves as a model for us. It really does. Well, that's easier to do once you renounce dogmatism, because there's this lurking fundamentalism uh, where people say, well, i got to come up with what seems the most likely and then dogmatize on that. Now, hey, hey, you, you don't have the right to do that. All these judgment have, judgments have to be tentative. Right, especially in this area. I mean, my gosh. Yeah, yeah it's why you wouldn't – I mean, it's if you're trying to come up with a good plot or a good story, which is what I do for a living – um, mm -hmm. you, you would try to say it's all the Flavians and just tie a neat bow over it. But in reality, you just have to keep the door open. Uh, you can't just, I mean, it's, it makes for a neat theory to say just the Flavians, the Flavians did this and only them. But really history is a little bit messier than that. And so, you don't seem to be, uh, dogmatizing. You're just saying, Let's see what sense this makes. I bet you're going to find it makes a lot more sense than you expected, and then it's up to the reader to decide what to do with it. Right, right. right. And that's exactly what we hope to do. And mm. Yeah, you did a great job. And uh, yeah, yeah, I wanted to also ask or maybe loop back to uh, the symbolism of the anchor and the dolphin because it's such mm. a cornerstone of your work, and it's, I mean, it's black and white. Maybe uh, unpack more about the symbolism because what it meant as a pagan symbol and what it means as a Christian symbol and how it evolved and where we found it. I, I believe, do you guys, in the book you talk about it's even older than the Romans, right? Right. It goes all the way back to Apollo uh, as a symbol of Apollo. On the island of Delos, you can see the uh, that symbol used uh, frequently. And uh, so originally it was borrowed from there by the Seleucids uh, and employed as a symbol for the Seleucid kings. And um, then because the Jews already were using anchors on their coinage and because the, the Vespasian and Titus were uh, gained their fame and their, their claim to the, uh, to the imperial seat by their, their campaigns in Judea, um, that they would use a coin combining an anchor and then this this image of the dolphin of Apollo um, would make sense for from a pagan perspective to to combine these symbols. Um, so that's how they came upon the symbol. Um, when we first discovered that this was the predominant family of symbols that were used by the Christians for the first three centuries um, in their catacombs and their grave sites and so forth, um, then we started looking in 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 earnest to find other examples that would have been from the Flavian time. And we found architectural details. And uh, I think it was at three in the morning that I finally found the, <laughs> the cover of the book, um, which was a mosaic. <laughs> and uh, it was in Herculaneum, which couldn't have been a perfect, more perfect time capsule, right? Because the Vesuvius mm. erupted two months after Vespa uh, Titus became emperor. So the whole place was frozen in time from, the, from Titus's reign. And here we, uh, I came across... Well, it was just a dream. It was it, literally the cover of the book looks like we designed it um, to to sort of like as a legend to explain the symbols. Um, but that's exactly what was on the on the uh, bottom of a pool in a gymnasium in Herculaneum. Um, so the in a sense, the Flavians created our cover. <laughs> well, it's extraordinary <laughs> that uh, fish. Uh, the, the imagery of fish in the Gospels is, of course, very, very famous and distinctive. You know, uh, Jesus recruits, of course, his first disciples by saying, I will make you fishers of men when right. finding fishing on the Sea of Galilee, right? And so fish become a symbol, if you will, of Christian converts, and just as the fish itself becomes a symbol of Jesus through the, you know, the name game, the, the letter game Ichthus, right? So uh, you have multiple, and of course, 
uh, Jesus is himself uh, fulfilling the sign of Jonah. So there's various reasons both in ancient Hebrew literature why I'd use the fish. And then, of course, there's the Apollo fish and anchor. But, but the dovetailing is very, very paradoxical. It's a graven image. It's a direct violation of Mosaic law, the divine, in any way. So and it's a symbol of Apollo. <laughs> of all of all graven images. So by the time the Christians in the early second century are adopting this, they have, they're clearly Paulines who have abandoned most Jewish inhibitions about uh, strict adherence to Mosaic law. And nobody was using the cross to what third century or even later. It, well, it was used occasionally in the uh, catacombs, uh, but uh, a small fraction compared to the number of times we see anchor and dolphin symbolizing Jesus, or simply an anchor symbolizing Jesus in the catacombs. And that's, that's really one of the fascinating things about the use of the image. Between the time of the fall of the Seleucid uh, kings and uh, the use of it by the Flavians, you really don't see it. Uh, uh, some people have asserted that Augustus used it. Not, not true. A systematic examination shows that the first Roman emperors, in fact, the first Roman state use of the what would become the distinctive symbol of Jesus in the earliest catacombs was by Titus. He only reigned two years as Roman emperor, and yet we have thousands upon thousands of different coin types using the very same image, and almost always on coins, they're the other side of the face of Titus. And of course, as as my co-author just pointed out, it's when you look at underneath the uh, the the ashes at uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum. Apparently, right at that very moment, fish and people were being juxtaposed with an anchor and symbolically compared by pagan Romans, just as we see the fish people comparison uh, being used in the Gospels. And what did you think about this evidence, Bob? I mean, I know the dolphin and the anchor is been even today. You can find it in Catholic stores in Europe. If you look at the coat of arms of the Vatican, uh, there's a ribbon that is strung around other objects in exactly the shape of an anchor, and you'll find lots of statues of Vespasian and Titus in, in the Vatican as well. Wow! Not, not to mention. It's the means, the, at least the symbolic means, by which St. Clement of Rome, uh, well, that a person that first uh, century um, tradition says that was a first century pope, later uh, Christian tradition says was a first century pope, uh, was martyred by means of an anchor. And is used, uh, uh, the anchor is used as a symbol for him. And he was the husband of Domitilla and her burial site is the oldest Christian archaeology in existence. And she was the granddaughter of Vespasian and the niece of Titus. Are you there, Bob? Yeah. I figured I'd been excommunicated there for a second. <laughs> we tied you to an anchor. So what did you think about the uh, the, the anchor symbolism, Bob? Uh, were you as uh, flabbergasted as I was? Because as I was saying, uh, this is a symbol that you can still find in Europe and stores and in my family. I think it's also, uh, at least until recently, maybe it still is the sign uh, for double day books, because uh, they, they used to have, have this Catholic imprint, uh, anchor books uh, with the the oh yeah dolphin and all that. Uh, yeah, it is amazing. I never had any idea that it had that importance or what it meant or the origins or anything. You know, it. it uh, I, I believe you guys say that it was already used by Jews, and that might seem a little odd if the persecuting Seleucids used it, but same thing again, there were plenty of Jews who liked the Seleucids and, and were assimilating, so that wouldn't be too much of a surprise either. Maccabean, Hasmonean nationalist kings were using it on their coinage. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Thanks a lot, Bob, for keeping us company and being a wingman in this on this episode of AM by Gnostic Radio. Oh, a privilege and a pleasure. Yes, it's great. And again, James and Warren, thank you very much for being on the show. And real quick, where can the audience find more about you if they want to check you out beyond uh, Amazon? Uh, well, you can. I have a website, Warren, uh, warrenfay.com, um, and my thriller novels are, are promoted there. Um, and, you know, I do write thrillers, so you can find those books uh, 
Okay. Available at any book, bookstore. Creating Christ has its own website, uh, creatingchrist.com. And, uh, you can check out some of the more, uh, some, some of the images. We've got additional images there. Uh, Dr. Price's review is, is up there and other material too that'll lead you to places. Um, but, uh, uh yeah, we, we go deeper into the archaeology there. And we do plan to write much more on this topic. We look forward to it, and of course, I'll yeah. have this information on the show notes. So, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here, and uh, good luck with uh, creating cries. How Roman emperors invented Christianity? Yeah, it's a big spoiler right in the title, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Gave it away. <laughs> it's a thriller. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. And there thou hast it, my beloved true seekers. The first part of our interview with James Valiant and Warren Faye, authors of the outstanding new book, Creating Christ, How Roman Emperors Invented Christianity. The empire never ended, and it seems the hologram is lifting a bit. And the hologram that Philip K. Dick wrote about lifts even more in our second part with Bob still being the most awesome of co-hosts in our second part we understand in depth the god Serapis and his influence on Christianity as well as the god Asclepius Bob, James and Warren give their take on the Jewish religion of those times and the zealots we take a deep dive into the Babel and how many of its contradictions point to a Roman construct. And very shocking, how not only did the Romans invent Christianity, but later also helped develop Islam. And what about the Gnostics? Who invented them? And we bat around the arguments for and against the historicity of Jesus and much more. So please become a member or patron at Patreon for the full toga. Just go to the God above God dad cam for the means or just message me. It's cheaper than a GMO Roundup Lace Burger or domestic beer. Cheaper than a movie ticket to some predictive programming content. Cheaper than your soul but you'll get back your spirit. A mere $5.99 a lunar cycle for this and all other complete shows. This includes full access to the archives with more than 425 episodes with the best and brightest in Gnosticism, Western esoteric and free thought. And full episodes of my vlog, The Abraxas Brief. You'll also get an invitation to the Inner Sanctum of Gnosis Facebook group, where I stream the Abraxas Brief live and answer your questions. And we always have some truly intriguing conversations. And I'm always there to address your issues and get the latest on Gnostic news around the universe. And even support in the form of some shekels to PayPal or the U.S. mail keeps this red pill cafeteria open. I can't do it without you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self. We've only just begun understanding what the Romans and all their holographic manifestations have done for us. And peace is not one of them. Peace you will find at the virtual Alexandria and that dream of you, that distant ship smoke on the horizon. Hello and goodbye as always. The incarnation of Simon the Mega, Mega, Mega. Devils into submission, into submission, into submission. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here I am, blades wide open like a specimen.
men Prisoner to some uncertain things So I just guess again Wrestling and rattling the cages But a college full of mages Couldn't save us from impending bifurcation Separation is a means of existence I make deals daily with demons Called the five senses Humanity is bleeding So I call it hive menses Period of turbulence Shaking up defenses we are the music makers And we are the dreamers of dreams We are the sins of the Father Made in His image as guilty machines We are the music makers And we are the dreamers of dreams We are the sins of the Father Made in His image as guilty machines between ape and angel, closer to ape Our lower energies propel us even closer to hate Eventually we're gonna have to make peace with our fate That from the moment you're born, it's already too late, 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 late. It's clear to anybody looking that we're being led on Through a Gnostic lens, you see we're being fed on Parasitic entities surviving off your life force Never lose your spark or your connection to divine source We are the music makers And we are the dreamers of dreams We are the sins of the Father Made in His image as guilty machines We are the music makers And we are the dreamers of dreams We are the sins of the Father Made in His image as guilty machines we are the